You're listening to Love Talk Live with the relationship expert, Jamie Bronstein, only on LA Talk Radio. Tom Field, welcome. Thank you. So, viewers, you are in for an amazing show because Tom is an amazing person and an amazing lawyer, and he's had a very long career that's extraordinary. So I'm going to read to you guys a little bit about Tom first, and then we'll get into some questions. So Thomas Field practices in the areas of matrimonial and family law, primarily in Cook and Lake Counties in Illinois, and where his expertise is of particular value throughout the state of Illinois. He is currently the head of the firm's family law practice group and has served as lead counsel in numerous trials. Mr. Field is a seasoned litigator of custodial sorry, custody disputes, relocation actions, including interstate and international matters, including the Hague Convention, resolution of post-dissolution conflicts, negotiation and drafting prenuptial and postnuptial agreements, and litigation of dissolution matters involving prenuptial and postnuptial agreements, as well as all family law related matters for same-sex couples. He offers specialized knowledge in the analysis of complex financial matters, including executive compensation, closely held businesses, and real estate holdings. Mr. Field has extensive experience representing C-suite executives of Fortune 500 companies, as well as local and nationally recognized celebrities. His practice is known particularly for its high level of discretion and his ability to protect the public image of his high-profile clientele without compromising their rights. So first of all, Tom, welcome. All that means is that I'm old now. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I've been doing this for a while. But isn't that amazing? Because with age comes wisdom. Right, right. And people would want to go to a lawyer who has wisdom and experience. You bet. Super important selection of lawyer. So one of the things that, that I know this just happened recently that I would love you to tell the viewers about is that you recently became certified as a financial litigator. So can you tell us exactly what that means and how does it demonstrate? How do you show that show up with your clients with that new degree? So for me, it's all about differentiation in my world, right? There's, there's a lot of choices and I came to the practice a little bit differently than most um, with a financial background already built in because I had a, I did a JD MBA when I was in school and picked up a bunch of financial knowledge coming into the practice. So I like to say that I'm a bit of a unicorn in my world anyway. <clears throat> the, the certified financial litigator piece came along um, because it's a relatively new organization and it was an opportunity for me to further hone my financial skills as they specifically apply to dissolution of marriage actions um, and parentage actions as well. So again, it was really a differentiator for me. Um, and unlike the MBA, which is more of a generalist business background in finance, uh, the CFL is really specific and tailored towards uh, complex divorce matters. So it's great. So people can go to, it's like a one-stop shop. They don't have to go to somebody else for financial stuff because you know it all. <laughs> I would like to think I know it all, Jamie. So thank you for that compliment. But I, I know a lot now. So I know what I know and I know what I still don't know. And there are times where we have to go outside of the firm to hire business valuation experts, for example, or forensic accountants. But when it comes to advising my clients as it relates to financial matters, uh, I like to think that I have the, the base of knowledge to really steer them in the right direction always. Yeah. And one thing about Tom, for anybody that's watching that might want to hire him, he is a very genuine, authentic guy. Like, I know that there are a lot of lawyers that get bad raps, but this is a lawyer who is a human who is going to go to bat for you and who is just going to do a really good job in a very authentic way. And so I feel like that's what puts you 
you know, on this beautiful, authentic pedestal compared to other lawyers. I mean, you're, you know that lawyers get bad raps, obviously. They do. And I struggle with it all the time uh, because, listen, you know, we get really warm referrals a lot. And it's always flattering when a former client will send somebody my way or another lawyer that I work with. But the reality is I'm always going through a beauty contest because there are a lot of choices in my world. And so for me, it's a matter of, I like the word that you used, authentic. Uh, I come to the practice with a really pragmatic approach. Uh, I try to be as objective and give my clients, you know, pure business advice. So without being, uh, without not giving them the thoughtful, caring advice that relates to family dynamics. And, you know, one of the things that I, I'm always quick to share with my clients is I'm a product of a divorce household. Mm. And there are a lot of us out there that are, right? But for me, I think it gave me a unique perspective on what I do uh, as a child who went through it and who really has a sensitivity to my clients and their children and how their children perceive them in the future. So, you know, when I often say to my clients, there's two goals that I have for them as far as, you know, maintaining their financial health, but also keeping their family intact. And oftentimes they look at me, you know, quizzically in saying, what do you mean? I'm getting divorced, like intact. And, and I have to bring them sort of back to center and say, listen, these children that you have are going to be a part of your life for a very, very long time. And you're going to have birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, weddings, God willing, grandchildren. And, you know, do you want your children to be uncomfortable when you and your soon to be ex-spouse are in the same room together? Right. And I speak to that, you know, with that experience and, you know, knowing that my parents have been divorced now for 30 plus years. I still have some levels of discomfort whenever they're together. And so you could have used or your parents could have used a you. They that could way. have. And, I, and I'd like to think it might have helped, but um, and it would have made my life a little bit more enriched, I think, um, in some respects. And nobody's doing it on purpose. And a lot of times parents just don't realize or recognize how impactful their behavior is and how much their children see it know it and, and are uncomfortable by it. Have you heard of the book Conscious Uncoupling? I have. I feel like you're, even though if you haven't read it or you don't necessarily practice those teachings, it sounds like that's, that's what you help people do. And, and it sounds like your empathy really puts you above other lawyers. Is that yeah. I mean, the, the example I sort of just gave you of, you know, trying to get my clients aligned with the idea of having a post-divorce relationship with their ex-spouse, or at least a good enough one where you can put on a smile and be in the same place where your children are okay with it is, is something that I really do preach. And especially to the clients who aren't initially receptive to it um, and think that they have such a horrible ex-spouse or just an awful situation that they just want to really walk away from and put up a wall. I mean, those are the ones where, you know, I, I feel like I wear a lot of hats in my job, you know, whether it's the, the therapist hat, the accountant hat, the financial advisor hat, you know, you name it in addition to just being their lawyer. But that's one where it's definitely not lawyering per se, but I feel a huge responsibility to my clients to set them on the right path. And so that's, that's what we try to do. And this is why you're good at what you do. Thanks. So let's get into, you know, a, a big, a big question that a lot of people have is people have written to me about it. So I want to help answer these questions for people. Um, I want to talk about mediation and why you feel like it's important if it's not important. Um, and then also then get into what makes for a smooth divorce? 
Sure. So I'll try to go in that order. Um, Either one. Medi yeah, mediation to me is huge. Um, I was an early adopter in the Chicago market of mediation. So there were very few people. If I go back 10, 12 years, there were very few lawyers who brought their cases into mediation with any degree of regularity. And there were very few qualified mediators that focused their practices on domestic relations law. You flash forward to the present and I would say at least 50% of my cases now I have the ability to bring into mediation. And there is a much wider swath of really high quality mediators to choose from, which is such a relief to, to those of us who really believe in mediation as, as a method of practice. You know, a lot of people don't understand mediation when they come to us. Um, they don't appreciate the benefit of it, maybe out of the gate. I try to sell it often. And to me, especially with, you know, my clientele, which skews to a, a pretty high net worth clientele, they want as much of their case to be done privately. They don't want fanfare. They don't want to risk their matter being in court one day and somebody in the neighborhood seeing them and starting to gossip. It's really the last thing they want. So, you know, that's one good reason for mediation. But another excellent reason is your children. <laughs> okay, because again, much more private, typically moves at a quicker pace. And I always say the sooner you get out of this, you know, phase of a divorce, the better. Um, you're saving money, you're saving anxiety, you get to move on. Um, one of the biggest reasons though for mediation to me is when a higher net worth client shows up, more often than not, that's not the client that has the house, the car, and the 401k and a W-2 salary. That's just not them. Uh, it's rare. So the higher net worth client is going to have multiple properties, perhaps complex compensation packages with restricted stocks, stock options, different vesting schedules, private equity investments, um, really interesting types of cash flow, as well as interesting types of assets. A lot of them are business owners. And as it relates to them, we have to deal with valuation issues often. So why better in mediation? Because rather than putting your case in front of a judge in a black robe, who has 1200 other cases on their docket and isn't gonna have the bandwidth to really focus on the details and talk it through with the lawyers and try to help facilitate a resolution, you get into a circumstance where you have your mediator neutral that is vested in your case and just your case. And that person can help work with you and your clients to understand their risks and understand the rewards of mediation, which are, building a resolution that's tailored to that case that many times has pieces to it that a judge couldn't even do. In other words, a judge doesn't necessarily have the authority to fix certain resolutions as far as how assets are divided, how cash flows are shared. And in the mediation world, you can be very particular and specific and build these agreements and the experience and the statistics show that mediated settlements are far longer lasting mm. than court rulings that we get from judges. So for all those reasons, not to mention that uh, as expensive as a day in mediation may be, it's a whole lot less expensive than working up a case and taking it to trial. So it seems like oh, gone. No, no, no. So that those are a lot of the reasons, probably not all of them, but that's what comes to mind most uh, when thinking about mediation. 
It just seems like mediation is more personable and not just like spewing out numbers and the judge is like, boom, boom, boom. It's just more interpersonal. And it's far more interpersonal. And what I love about it is, you know, I have sort of my favorite mediators around town, but it gives me an opportunity a lot of times to work with the attorney on the other side of the case to select a mediator who may be best suited for that case, whether they have superior financial acumen or superior interpersonal psychological skills to work with difficult clients or clients who have emotional needs. Um, and, you know, a mediator that I know some of them are more patient and or less patient than others dealing with emotional issues. So that's, that's really important. And, you know, you sort of know your client and then you try to piece it together with the right mediator. But that's also why you're a good lawyer, because other lawyers might not take that much time to really pick the right mediator. So anybody who's in Illinois, pick this guy. <laughs> so let's get into what do you think are the, are the keys to a smooth divorce, the easiest, most peaceful divorce possible? So... I, I like really and do you quickly, think that I'm peaceful sure. and divorce can be in the same sentence? <laughs> they can, they can. Um, uh, listen, I, you know, anecdotally, the the attorney who founded my firm, Miles Bierman, he's 85 years old, still comes into the office a little bit, and he's on his third marriage, but he has been so successful in how he's lived his life with his last ex-wife, um, they, they still vacation together as couples. They stay at each other's homes when they're visiting the kids in different places. And I often say to him, I'm like, you live the utopian divorce. Like, that's not real. And he said, and he said to me, like, you know, it's real if two people are committed to making that real. So, you know, Bruce you and said, Demi. Yeah, exactly. They were quarantining together. And so. not just on couple, you know, Gwyneth and um, Chris Martin, they're, they're the poster children for content. Exactly. It exactly. can happen. It can happen. Um, so I always keep that in mind. Um, but really the first thing that needs to happen to me is it's a t attorney selection is huge. Um, I... I always say, if somebody doesn't know a good lawyer that does what I do, you know, get, get a couple referrals and don't just hire the first person. Um, you know, just because a lawyer was good for your next door neighbor doesn't mean that's the right lawyer for you. Uh, you know, your next door neighbor might have liked the idea of having a real pit bull attorney and he or she may not have had children that were going to be collateral damage from a divorce. And it may only been about money. And that meant to them that they could get away with having a situation where they weren't going to ever see each other at the get again at the end of the day and the gloves came off and they duped it out. That may not be good for you. Um, you know, one person may have a closely held business in their marriage where both parties worked in it and shared income and, you know, responsibilities. And, you know, their friend may have had that straightforward, you know, 401k house and a car and a dog kind of case. So I always encourage people, don't just hire the first person you talk to unless you absolutely click with them and are convinced that they have the skill set for you in your case, great. Um, but otherwise, it's okay to do a little bit of shopping. And it's, yeah. it's stressful, uh, but, it, but it's a huge decision. And uh, you can't make it lightly. Yeah, well, people go to doctors to get second opinions. And this is your life. Like, your life is so important. And so it's, it would be important to get a second opinion or to to shop for lawyers just like you would shop for a doctor absolutely absolutely so you know going back to your question how to have this successful divorce it's really start out with that premise you know hire the right lawyer don't lose control 
uh, some lawyers will sort of take control and dictate how things go with their clients. You know, I often say to my clients, listen, if you don't like my advice, that's okay. Please, you know, push back and we'll find a comfortable medium, you know, along the way. But if you're constantly pushing back and not following my advice or asking me to take different tracks to represent you that I don't feel comfortable with, then I'm not your right. I'm not the right lawyer for you. And that's okay. Um, and, and that's okay. But it also probably means that you're not handling your case the right way in some respects. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's getting a lawyer who isn't going to necessarily dictate to you and take things off track. Um, I can think of, you know, one or two cases that I have right now where I, I can tell that the lawyer on the other side of the case is pushing their client or feeding their client along the way um, or feeding the emotional aspect of the case. So, you know, if, if I've got the husband and the wife is just really pissed with him, like for whatever reason, um, you know, and her attorney is, you know, fueling that fire, that's not helpful. <laughs> You know, right. the, 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 her attorney in a situation like that should be saying, listen, park it over here, all your anger, and let's just focus on the yes. resolution. Yes. Because as soon as we're finished, you can go on with your life. You'll have your money here. You'll have your property here. We'll have the parenting arrangement. And then you can see if you can work on your relationship with your ex. To or call me to do some... <laughs> Therapy exactly, exactly. To get to a better place. And so many of my clients need that, you know, during the case. Uh, it's, it was a question. This is interesting, Jamie. It was a question that I was nervous to ask, you know, probably the first 10 years of my career when a client would come in and I could tell they really needed some help outside of our arrangement, right? I was doing too much counseling and not enough lawyering and it was distracting. Mm -hmm. And listen, let's be realistic about it too. I'm an expensive therapist, <laughs> right? <laughs> not that you don't earn your money and that you shouldn't charge a high hourly rate, but, but for my clients to pay me for that kind of advice, which frankly is not my, you know, and you're not inherent trained. training. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't go to school for that. You know, I mean, it's it's come through osmosis, but I didn't go to school. You're good that's, at it naturally. Yeah, that's silly, though, for them to do that. They really very often need that outlet um, and with whatever frequency they need it. Sometimes they need it more frequently than others. But as I've gotten more comfortable in my own skin when it comes to advising my clients on their mental health, I have become less fearful of bringing it up and very often will make recommendations to them, you know, something to the effect of, you know, we, we, we keep coming back to this topic. I really think, you know, there's somebody else that's better suited to have that dialogue with you. And and that it would even help me work with you better if you had that outlet. And so there's, there's some techniques that I picked up along the way. Um, and that's been important too, because to the point of, you know what you know and you know what you don't know, uh, you have to rely, any good lawyer that does what I do will have their stable of resources. And you have to rely on those resources but I love that you, throughout the years, it's like you are, one of the things I work with with my clients is to help them use their voice and to honor their voice and to not second guess it. And you are using your voice to share helpful information to your clients. You're saying, Absolutely. I believe this is going to help you immensely. And also it's kind of like people go to, to rabbis, like say a couple goes to a rabbi for some counseling, but then the rabbi is not going to meet with them weekly forever. The rabbi <laughs> sends them to right. a therapist. It's kind of the same thing. Like you have, you get to a point where you say, if you really want to really enhance your life psychologically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, it's time to go to a, a weekly therapist or, or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not your job. 
No, no. And again, it's sort of, you have to know your role in the, in the whole landscape of the dissolution of action, of marriage action. And, and sometimes it's not your role. Yeah. But you do, you take them to a certain level, which is great. Because some Absolutely. lawyers will do that. Absolutely. And listen, you know, part of my job, I feel like, is also doing my due diligence on those in my community that do what you do. Uh, because it's so important to have that stable, right? Yeah. Um, to have the right people. Like, you know, so if a client says, I need somebody for my five-year-old daughter, I have somebody that comes to mind yeah. immediately. Um, you know, I need somebody for my teenage son. That's a different person. So mm -hmm. that's great. really important. Referrals. Okay, so let's talk about divorce during this beautiful COVID quarantining, sheltering in place, <laughs> amazing time. Challenging. <laughs> yeah. Let's, or we can look at it as beautiful opportunities for growth. Um, so what has been going on? Have you found that there are, you've been getting lots more phone calls? What also have been, has been happening in the judiciary and like what has changed in, in literally the laws during this time? Um, so just tell us all. So I'd say the second half of March was strange, right? Nobody knew what was going on. Uh, um, I remember my last day in court being March 16th. I think I was the last attorney in my entire firm to have a matter up in court. I had a client who was desperate to get divorced that day. The judge was willing to come in. We came in. We shut down the courthouse in Cook County at the Daily Center and finished the case. The client was thrilled. And I went over two months before I stepped foot in my office again after that day. Um, so it was really interesting. And after about two weeks, the presiding judge started issuing these general orders about, about how things were going to go. Uh, going forward. And those orders kept getting revised every week or two, and sometimes every day, depending on uh, the nature of them. But the judges slowly, and it took some of them a while, but slowly came around and understood that they had to get accustomed to Zoom. And lawyers had to get accustomed to Zoom. I would tell you that it made a lot of my partners who don't have mediation as a big part of their practice, even more uncomfortable. They're pure litigators, a few of them. Mm -hmm. And the idea that they couldn't get themselves into a courtroom was really frustrating. Um, and getting hearings with the judges or even status appearances with the judges was slow going for, for probably the first six weeks or so. And then the, finally the courts came around and slowly have ramped up. I would tell you now I probably have a court appearance at least every other day um, on my cases, which is refreshing because it means there's movement. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been great uh, for clients who were really scared or nervous um, about being able to finish their cases yeah. as well as, as clients who called and said, I want to get my case going. What does that look like? But I have to say for the last, you know, at least eight weeks, I've been telling people, well, listen, the courts are wide open, just not to us physically necessarily being there. Um, and I don't know. I mean, there are some outlying counties uh, where the judges are asking the attorneys to show up. Um, it's fine. Not my cup of tea at the moment, uh, but it's fine. And we're navigating that. Um, but, but really, it's, it's enlightened me about how important mediation is, <laughs> not to go back to that. But I have been mediating like crazy. Uh, and getting even a higher percentage of my clients into mediation because that has been available to them and something that 
they can see movement in their case and there's time that we can invest in it. I will say that all of my existing clients are way ramped up right now and we're really busy dealing with existing clients. Um, I've been trying to navigate the landscape a little bit with my partners and partners at our competitor firms to try to figure out what does it look like? Is everybody, are people getting new business? Is it slow? Is it not slow? Um, I'm super fortunate, like super busy, new business is flowing. There's a lot of people even, you know, at the upper end of my practice though, that are telling me that they're slow right now with new business. Um, it, it tells me from some of the experiences that I've had though with prospective clients or some existing clients that are a little bit scared of their shadow right now that COVID has really thrown a wrench into life and not, not so unlike the 08, 09 financial crisis when people lost so much money and, and their houses went into foreclosure and a lot of people, not at the high end of the practice, but a lot of just sort of middle America, they, they couldn't move. So you had all these couples in houses mm -hmm. and they were underwater and they would have to either short sell them or go through for foreclosure in order to actually physically separate. So a lot, a lot of people in 08, 09 were like, listen, we don't like each other, but you sleep in that room, I'll sleep in this room. We'll keep paying the bills together as best we can. And once this economy comes back a little bit, then the real estate market comes back a little bit and we can afford to sell this house or refinance and, have it and get two out. houses. Yeah. Then, yeah. then we'll get divorced. So I would equate that a little bit to now because even though for a lot of people, the economy's bounced back a little. Um, for a lot of people, you know, they see their 401k, the stock market is a lot higher than a lot of people anticipated that it would be right now. But geez, for the overwhelming majority of people, you know, what, what the next day looks like, what the next month looks like, all these people in the hospitality industry that are just being devastated on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I, I certainly feel for those people and that's, that's, that's tough right now. Um, you know, you lump that, you know, uncertainty about finances on top of potential health issues. You lump that on top of all these parents that have school age kids, right? You and I can, can relate. So, you know, with a nine year old and a 12 year old, we went through homeschooling from, you know, the second half of March through middle of June. It was painful. Uh, I, I mean, Are you, you know, actually going back to school soon. So TBD, uh, no. Chicago public well, schools have said we're, uh, we're going to have at least two days a week of in-person, you know, teaching and three days a week of at home. I, I'm waiting to, for the shoe to drop, but... Uh, well, Noah I, I is 100% on Zoom here in LA. I just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, no crystal ball over here, but I, I, if I had to guess, I'd say the teachers union may have something to say about whether they actually go back or not, but we'll see. Um, but listen, for all those parents who, whether it's at home or partial in school, it's a real wrench in life, especially if you've got a dual income household where both parties are working. Uh, you know, how do you divide and conquer, especially when you have multiple children? And that's a tough one. And then for those parents who need to be out of the house for work, whether they're first responders, whether they are essential workers of another nature, how do you get childcare right now? You know, right. almost every day care is closed. And, you know, unless you've got a nanny that lives with you and can afford that luxury, you know, they're not really coming and going very often. So it really puts a crimp in life. And so a lot of people are saying, 
the now is not the, the idea of a divorce, right? I want it, I need it, but geez, do I need to add something else stressful on my top right. of my life right now when I have, you know, a bouquet of other issues that I'm dealing with. So well it seems like if money was not an object, if money was not a factor from what I've seen with my clients and what I've seen in the media and what I've read about and from my colleagues, 100% more people do, like you're saying, want to get divorced because of this. However, yes. it might not be happening right now. No, I suspect there's some serious pent up demand out there. Yeah. And, uh, living, but getting through it. Yes. Um, from what I hear from, you know, my ear to the wall, uh, there is, but to your point, those who don't have the financial stress, um, those are the ones that are still moving forward right now because it, it doesn't matter. That part of it doesn't matter to them. And once you take out the financial stress, the rest of it just becomes, you know, managing the emotional IQ of it. Yes. Okay, so we are getting to be almost out of time. I do want to I do want to talk about how you have you have high very high powered clients. And I know you also want to talk about prenups. So maybe we can kind of in the next 5 minutes talk about how you deal with these high powered clients and then also your thoughts on prenups. So I'll knock out prenups first. Uh, knock it out. Prenups, way more in vogue than they used to be. I would say early on in my practice, I'd do one a year, maybe two. Um, now it's, you know, at least probably one every other month. Uh, it's, it's a great tool for couples where estate planning doesn't necessarily cut it. Um, I always say a prenup is a tool that is like an estate plan on steroids because it allows you to opt in or out of certain matrimonial laws, regardless of what state you're in. Uh, you can't address child related issues in them, but anything financial, whether it's how to address income, the different sources of income somebody has, future spousal support, uh, future property divisions, including upon divorce or upon death. So there is no, you know, sometimes people say, is there a template that I can look at? No, we tailor it to a case. Somebody wants to just protect whatever they come to the marriage with, fine, we got that. If they wanna uh, segregate some income, if they wanna segregate income from a specific source, um, a lot of times our clients are those coming where one spouse has a family business interest. Um, or they're the child of the patriarch or matriarch that has a family business. And, you know, it's not, not about slighting their future son-in-law or daughter-in-law. It's more about just making sure that in the ultimate event of a divorce, that their child isn't put in a position where they have to liquidate stock in the company, stress the company to buy out the other spouse that the other spouse has voting rights in a company that they might not have a relation to in the future. So I'm a big fan. Um, and I think if a couple can survive going through the negotiation of a prenup, then the rest of the marriage is easy. No, um, it's not the most comfortable. No, it's not. It gets, it can be a little uncomfortable. Uh, but you know, no different than talking about an estate plan where you're talking about what happens when you die. Right. Oh. So it's, they're both not terribly uncomfortable or not terribly comfortable. I remember um, being right out of college and sitting at my first job and talking about my 401k and, and dying. And, and I was like, I, I'm 22 years old. This is depressing. Like, yeah, why, right. why? It was my first entry into why do we have to do all these things, but it's important and it's part of life, but it's not. Fun. It is. It is. So higher profile clients. Um, they can be fun. They can be a royal pain in the butt. So I always say- But you have them. So that's great for your business. 
business. It's great for business. It's good PR for us. Um, and it's nice to be relied upon in that world as somebody who has the capacity to advise a client um, that is in a unique position of celebrity status or whether they're an athlete, an entertainer, um, a politician, I mean, or just a C-suite executive who has notoriety because of their, their position in the business world. So those are always interesting cases. They all come to me in different ways. Um, whether they be from sports agents, and I know you and I have a fond uh, affinity towards one uh, in the baseball world. Uh, I, I, so baseball, football, basketball, um, those have all come my direction. And, and listen, they're all interesting because you have to, if you don't have it already, you have to understand how each league works, their schedules, for parenting, they can be super difficult challenges. Um, I'm navigating one for an NFL player right now and trying to assess and compartmentalize the preseason schedule with the off-season training schedule, with the in-season schedule, with the playoff potential schedule. It's a lot. Uh, there's really four different parts of the year for those players, and their schedule is different during each part. I mean, it's probably uh, unpredictability also. Completely yeah, unpredictable. Yeah. I mean, if, if, the, if the client's team makes the playoffs, yeah. then who knows when the season's over? Um, if the client's team, you know, in the NFL is selected to play on Thanksgiving or, you know, any a different holiday, it, it, it changes the dynamic. So those are difficult cases um, just inherently because of some of those aspects to them, uh, how they get paid, when they get paid, uh, our differences. Um, and, and, and the personalities are interesting too, because sometimes you don't necessarily have the bat phone to your client and the bat phone is to their manager, their PR, our person, their agent, their yeah. assistant. Um, and so it's, it's really learning the, the sphere of that individual client to know what their needs are and how to communicate with them. Uh, and, and if not most important, uh, how to keep that case low profile. <laughs> Uh, because those are the people that don't want to be in the news for that Absolutely. reason. They love being in the news for the work they do. They hate All being the in the news for their personal lives. Yes, yeah, so well, that makes sense. So, Tom Field, how can people reach out to you? Um, what do you, you want to tell us your firm's website, your personal, sure. anything? Sure. Uh, so, the firm's website is w www.beermanlaw, B-E-E-R, like you drink, M-A-N-N-L-A-W.com. Uh, you can look me up on our website. We have a beautiful new website, actually, that launched last week. Uh, or they can reach me through the firm at 312-621-9700. Wonderful. And as always, everybody can reach me at therelationshipexpert.com. So Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. This was very inspirational. I'm sure it's going to help so many people. Jamie, thank you so much for having me. I mean, time flew and uh, I hope your audience uh, appreciated it and, and learned something. They definitely will. So thanks for joining us. Everybody, thanks for watching and I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. You're listening to Love Talk Live with the relationship expert, Jamie Bronstein, only on LA Talk Radio.